Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and you're very welcome to the third webinar in the Chagas Research Insights webinar series. This series will address the challenges and opportunities in the agri-food sector and showcase the latest thinking on a range of topics. The webinars will outline Chagas' research and innovation in these areas. The current webinar trilogy focuses on the importance of soil health for underpinning food production and other environmental goods and services. Today's webinar will be given by four presenters, Professor Gary Lanigan, um, Ms. Lillian O'Sullivan, Dr. David Wall, and Dr. Donal O'Brien. At the end of the webinars, there will be a questions and answers discussion. So if you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A tab uh, as the webinars progress and indicate the question, who, or who you would like the question to be directed to. So I'd like to introduce our first speaker, who is Professor Gary Lanigan. Gary is a principal research officer and his research focuses on agricultural greenhouse gas emissions and soil carbon cycling. And he is one of the lead authors of the Chagas Mac uh, curve. So Gary, I'd like to welcome you to uh, give your, your opening presentation. Gary's presentation is going to be on what is carbon sequestration and how will we measure it? So what we're doing here is, um, soil health relates to the functional uh, ability of soils to, to carry out certain processes. And one of those processes is carbon sequestration and storing carbon. So Gary, can you please share your screen and, and start your presentation? Thank you very much, Carol. Um, okay, so today I'm going to be talking about what is carbon sequestration how, and how can you measure it? So, um, all the time I'm asking about carbon sequestration. There's, there's loads of um, questions about it. There's loads of um, people that are not quite sure about what it means, etc. Okay, so let's go through it. Okay. Okay, so why is soil organic carbon important? Well, Obviously, and um, the main reason is that it enhances carbon sinks, so it removes carbon dioxide directly from the atmosphere and stores it either in woody biomass or in the soils. And that is the, in, 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 terms of, in terms of the main, um, the main public engagement with it, that is the, that's the most important part of it. But it also, um, is important for greater soil health in that it allows for the better retention of ammonia men and potassium, phosphorus, calcium, magnesium. It keeps phosphorus available at high and low pHs. It reduces bulk density and thus compaction and runoff. And it improves soil water holding capacity. So soil organic carbon, um, we always say is the hidden nutrient or the hidden, the, the hidden fertilizer. It's important not only to remove CO2 from the atmosphere, but for general soil health. Okay. And it's important in terms of our greenhouse gas emissions because if we look at what we can currently count, what we look at here in terms of grasslands, grasslands are currently counted, even though everybody says that our grasslands are sequestering carbon, our grasslands are currently counted as a source of carbon of six and a half million tons of CO2. And that's mainly because the, the, the CO2 that we're counting is the emissions from our grasslands that are on peat soils, okay? Not the ones on mineral soils. So what we're currently counting is not our carbon sequestration on mineral soils, but our carbon release from peat soils, okay? So what can we count? We can count our, the, the carbon sequestration in trees. We can count the land use change from cropland to grassland and the amount of carbon in our soils. So how does carbon sequestration work? So carbon sequestration works because photosynthesis draws in CO2 from the atmosphere. That CO2 is utilized to, that CO2 is utilized to grow biomass, which is either grass or trees or crops or whatever, okay? But because those, those crops or grass grows, 
they respire the same way as us humans do. So they release CO2 as well. So they take in a lot of CO2, they release a certain proportion of it, about a third of the CO2 they take in, they release back out. But then as um, the roots decompose and some of the leaves decompose, etc., you've got microbes, you've got fungi, etc., and they release CO2 as well, okay, which is microbial respiration. And then you take the biomass away and you have to count the biomass you take away. And also carbon gets released, uh, gets leached out of the system. And then ultimately after that, you have carbon that's left behind in the soil, which is the final amount that is sequestered. And the rule of thumb is it's around about 10% uh, of the carbon taken in gets sequestered into the soil. So why is measuring soil carbon different or difficult? And the reason is you're trying to measure a very, very small input, maybe a quarter of a ton or a half a ton per year into a very large pool, okay? So the, the carbon in the soil might be two, three, a thousand tons of carbon per hectare per year, and you're trying to measure a quarter or half a ton of carbon input per year. So it's a very small input into a very large pool. Okay, the, and, and, and the other reason uh, that soil carbon is difficult to measure is it takes a long time because it's, it's, it's only very small buildup. It then takes a very, very long time to measure. So you start off with say a cropland or a grassland in, under management A, you change it. So you've got your initial soil carbon content, you change it and you end up with your new equilibrium, okay? And what you can actually count in your inventories is the difference between point A and point B. So your initial soil carbon content and your new equilibrium. And the important thing to look at here is the new equilibrium. So the top 30 centimeters of soil is what the IPCC, which is the carbon uh, accountancy body, and um, they only measure the top 30 centimeters. And in the top 30 centimeters, that tends to, to actually, that sink fills up. If you think of it as a sink, fills up quite, over about 50, 60, 70 years, and it's full. And then you've got a new equilibrium and it can't take any more carbon in. Importantly, it can, of course, release. So if you change from management B to back to management A, it will release carbon back into the system. Okay, so the other thing to uh, think about is that soil, not all soil organic carbon is the same. So you have different pools, you have unprotected pools. Um, so this is carbon like glucose, sucrose, etc., which turns over really, really quickly within the space of a year. You've got what we call um, physically protected carbon. That's either uh, inside soil aggregates or is actually occluded onto clay particles. And that carbon, is very resistant to being decomposed because there's no oxygen within those aggregates. So oxygen is always the mediator of decomposition and release of carbon, okay? Or it's biochemically protected. And the biochemically protected carbon is carbon that's been transformed into a really complex state. So it's very, very hard for microbes to attack it and decompose it, okay? So you've three different pools unprotected, physically protected, chemically protected. Okay, and these are, these can be lost very easily, lost over maybe 10 to 100 years, and the recalcitrant stuff, hundreds to thousands of years. Okay. Okay, the other thing to be aware of is that soil type is very, very important. So sandy soils, if you think of it as a sink, uh, a sandy soil cannot hold a huge amount of carbon. 
So it has a very small sink, like a wash hand basin. Uh, the higher the clay content, um, the larger the sink. Okay, so a very, very heavy clay saw would be like a bath, for example. So it has the potential to hold much more carbon. Okay, the next thing I'm going to talk about is the deficiency uh, within the carbon accountancy mechanism at the moment. So at the moment, we just, we just account for the top 30 centimeters, which we can see here. Okay, only the IPCC, the Governmental Panel on Climate Change, only monitors to the top 30 centimeters. But in Irish soils, this bubble graph, so what this bubble graph shows is that on the, uh, the x-axis here is the size of the aggregate. And as the aggregate size decreases down to zero, the carbon becomes harder to mobilize. Okay, so it's much more resistant to decomposition. And what we can see here is we've got loads of carbon, of course, in the top 30 centimeters. Um, but importantly, um, for some of our soils, for our brown earths, we've got loads of um, labile carbon or carbon that's easy to decompose in the lower depths, which is quite unusual. And that's because it gets rained down to lower air to lower layers because we have a lot of rainfall. And we've also got, in some of our soils, a lot of really, really hard to break down carbon in the lower layers. So a lot of our carbon that's not decomposing is below our 30 centimeters, okay? So it's not compliant with our inventories at, at, the, at the present time. Okay, impact of management and drainage. So, the next thing I'll talk about here is that our croplands, oh, sorry, our croplands um, generally have about one to 4% soil organic carbon. Um, that's a management issue, but also a soil type issue because our croplands tend to be on our lighter soils, okay? And as you can see, they tend to have poorer soil structure, less aggregates, okay? And they're lighter in color because they have less carbon. So carbon is black, so the darker, the soil, the more carbon in general that it contains. You look at our grassland on mineral soil, and this is a cropland from Oak Park and a grassland from Oak Park. Okay, you can see the grassland has a much better soil structure, much more aggregates than the soil, than the cropland soil, and it's darker in color. Okay, so it has more carbon in it. Then you look at the peatland soils, much, much darker. Okay. And the peatland soils typically have up to 50% of our soil organic carbon. So our peatland soils are very, very different to our mineral soils, okay? They have huge stores of carbon in there. Okay, so what's the effect of management? So management, again, is driven by oxygen. So if you plow up a soil, for example, you aerate the soil, you break down the aggregates, and the aggregates, the carbon in the aggregates then are, are readily decomposable, and they decompose the CO2. And again, um, with peatland soils, if you lower the water table, you introduce oxygen into the system, and because the peatland soils have huge stores of carbon, you can get huge emissions out of them. Okay? Three minutes, Gary. So, Three minutes. Yeah. Grant. So lastly, how do we measure carbon sequestration? Well, with great difficulty is the answer. So we can, we can take, a, for example, a land use or a land management change, and we can sample across it, and we can measure, say, a cropland or a grassland under different management from management A and move to management B, wait for a pile of time and measure it again, or we can measure grasslands that are on the same soil type in the same, the same um, climate and, and, and measure those and see what the difference is. The other way we can do it is to measure all the fluxes. So we can measure photosynthesis in, respiration out, and do what I call glorified accountancy, profit and loss. Okay, and the profit and loss way of doing it is advantageous because we can get an annual, an annual value. 
how do we do it? Okay, so what we do is we have a, a technique called eddy covariance. So we, we're measuring at the field scale, at the hectare scale, and we're measuring these eddies in the atmosphere, which are bubbles of gas. They rotate in the atmosphere. CO2 is released or any gas is released that joins up into the eddy. So we can measure the concentration change in the eddy. We can measure the rate at which the eddy is turning over. So we can measure a flux. Okay. So as the as carbon is released out of the system, it joins up into the eddy. As it's sucked out of the eddy, we can measure that as well. Okay. So the other thing we can use is carbon isotopes. So carbon isotopes is like a label that you put on the carbon. So it's a label that's very, very distinct. So what we can do then is we can follow that carbon label from photosynthesis. We can follow it through plant respiration. We can follow it through down into dissolved carbon. We can follow it through what the microbes use and eventually into what's into the soil. So it's a very, very distinct label that we can look and we can see what's happening far sooner than if we're looking at the whole pool. Okay, so what is our pathway forward at the end? So our pathway um, in Chagas is to monitor change on our research farms, our signpost farms, and selected peat soil sites, which are very, very important. We sample our national soil database sites, we're going to use remote sensing as proxies for some of the data that will be required because this is going to be field scale, not farm scale, field scale data that we need to look at. We, use, we will use the flux data to refine our models and we will ultimately probably require enhanced national farm survey and enhanced slippage reporting in order to be able to count our carbon sequestration and be able to gain benefit from it. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Gary, and, and sorry for having to uh, to push you on. Um, so just to remind everybody um, watching the webinar, if you have any questions, please do type them into the Q&A tab and keep them concise and indicate who you'd like uh, to answer the question. I'd like to ask Lillian now to start sharing her screen. So Ms. Lillian O'Sullivan is a research officer in Johnstown Castle. She's currently completing her PhD research and her research focuses on soil science, land use and spatial analysis. And today she's going to talk to us about Irish soils and carbon, uh, giving us a national picture. Over to you, Lillian. Thank you. Okay, very good. Thank you very much, Carl, and good morning uh, to everybody who is joining us today. So in addition to the measurements um, at that local scale and the landscape scale, there's also a requirement to be able to make a statement at the national scale in terms of the climate regulation potential of the soils. And today the focus of this presentation really uh, will be mostly at that national scale in relation to studies um, that we have completed. So in the first instance, to be able to make any statement at national scale, um, we need to have knowledge on the nature and properties of the soil and also their geographic distribution and extent. So we here in Ireland and especially in Togask actually, we have a very long history of soil survey and mapping and all of that legacy work has been brought forward and utilized in the development of the third edition soil map of Ireland that you see here. So this map was developed using legacy data uh, but also traditional soil survey and novel uh, digital soil mapping techniques. Um, it's at a resolution of one is to 250,000. And the reason for this is that that is the recommended scale at which regional challenges can be identified. So it was launched in 2014 and it coincided also with the launch of the Irish Soil Information System, which is a database online and it's available through the link on that slide at the bottom there. And that data set, it's Inspire compliant. And what that means is that Chagas is well positioned to partner with other countries as we try to maintain our soil carbon and work towards uh, the principles of soil health in general for future generations. 
So what have we done with this national level soil survey and this uh, data set? So in relation to soil organic carbon, it has allowed us to develop a baseline. And here you can see three maps that reflect the soil organic um, stock in mineral soils. Um, and uh, you can see their spatial distribution and the geographic variation of these stocks at the different depths. Uh, but on aggregate, uh, it is estimated that there is about 1,800 megatons of CO2 equivalent in these soils. And also, we looked at those soils that have additional capacity to sequester larger stores of carbon in the subsoils that Gary has already spoken about. And those are estimated to contain about 253 megatons of CO2 equivalent. And when you think that at national level, our total annual emissions for Ireland are about 60, um, 60 megatons of CO2 equivalent, it's, it's really quite a significant um, carbon stock. Um, so uh, it's also being mentioned, uh, this issue around sampling depth. Um, and we wanted to explore to what depth also empirical soil organic carbon measurements would be required to allow us to derive accurate estimates of soil organic uh, carbon in profiles. So we know that most models and the inventories, they focus on the top 30 centimetres of the soil. And while that captures the magnitude, um, we've already heard this morning that this does not capture quality in terms of residence time. And what this can do really, I suppose, in real terms is actually not only underestimate your soil organic stock, uh, carbon stock, but also potentially miss those opportunities to utilize or harness the potential of this pool. Um, but of course that too relies on us uh, now needing research to know how to do that. And that's, that's something that David will touch on in his presentation. Uh, but in terms of uh, being able to uh, get an accurate estimation of the carbon stock in soils, um, if you measure to 50 centimeters depth, it accounts for 90% of the variation in, in your total uh, stock to one meter. Okay, so uh, to now I've spoken quite a bit about our mineral soils, uh, but of course the peats or the organic soils are a particularly important uh, store of carbon in Ireland. We know that peats occupy between 20 and 25% of our soils, so they're a huge uh, carbon store. But of particular interest um, are those so soils that have been artificially um, drained for agricultural land. So we wanted to try and get a, a, a first estimation on what um, that extent might be and also to simulate what drainage emissions associated um, with that would be. So as you can see on the graph here, uh, up to the yellow bar, um, this is the aerial extent of those histic or those peat soils that have a high organic carbon content um, greater than 20% and that's estimated at about 370,000 hectares and emissions uh, associated with drainage of those um, are at about 8.7 or modeled at 8.7 megatons of CO2 equivalent. So, so a major source or a hotspot of emissions associated with those. Uh, we also have those uh, hybrid peaty mineral um, soils, which also are, are another um, source of emissions at about 1.8 uh, megatons of CO2 equivalent. Uh, so were we to drain, uh, sorry, if we were to rewet um, some of those uh, peat soils. Um, we modelled that that could be annual uh, savings estimated at about 3.2 megatons of CO2 equivalent. So again, of course, this comes with um, a whole research requirement uh, in terms of um, how best to approach uh, rewetting and also land utilisation and so forth. Um, and that's work that needs to be done um, moving forward. Okay, so uh, by now what you can see ultimately is that soils, they can be either a sink or they can be a source of carbon. And in large part, this relies on how soils are managed. And I suppose really what we want to be able to do is to really try to at least partially offset our agricultural greenhouse gas emissions and use this 
um, use the soil in so far as is possible to be a sink. And um, here is a map where we have combined component studies that looked at different aspects of the carbon cycle. And really what is required is a proactive management of soil organic carbon that is different based upon your soil type. And so this can include maintaining or protecting those important uh, carbon stores and um, looking at uh, plugging some of those hotspot of emissions, you know, those drained organic peat soils uh, and selectively remediating some of those and um, looking to at uh, those soils that have additional capacity to sequester carbon in the subsoil. What are the opportunities there and how can we utilize that pool? And also looking at, um, you know, how do you optimize nutrient imbalances and, and going forward, looking at uh, very tailored drainage operations, but also the role of land use change, for example, uh, enhancing sequestration um, through afforestation. Uh, so, of course, we've been involved in, in other projects um, um, where the role of carbon and soils is considered. And uh, here I show again this slide, I think it's been shown before in this series, um, where really we're demanding quite a lot from our soils. And uh, it's really that all soils can provide all of these functions, but that different soils are, of course, better at the provision of some functions over others. And one of the functions that was looked at within the landmark project is carbon storage and if we want to try to support management uh, to enhance that then we do need uh, tools and supports uh, for advisors and farmers also at local scale and one of the outcomes or outputs of that project was the development of a soil navigator where the user is allowed to um, selectively choose those soil functions which um, they would like to optimize and of course one of those being uh, the carbon function of the soils. We also have a project uh, started this year that's looking at hedgerows. Um, so hedgerows are a particularly important landscape feature in the Irish landscape. Uh, quite a lot has been done in terms of estimating the extent. So our colleagues in Ashtown and their partners um, in the recent Briar project estimated um, in excess of 600,000 uh, kilometers of hedgerows in this country. So that's a really important um, stock. However, we do need to understand more around uh, the real value of that stock and also the sequestration uh, associated or otherwise um, with management. So what we're looking at in this project is um, trying to take those remote measurements and relate those to measure, measured biomass and calculating the carbon stock with those. So as you can see here on the schematic on the left, we have the different carbon pools. So we've our above ground, we need to look at the below ground, but also um, in relation to this morning's uh, discussion, uh, the soil organic carbon. So remoting, uh, collecting here, you see me making litter traps, collecting our litter fall, doing some destructive sampling that we can also get a handle on the below ground biomass, but also how is the soil affected under hedgerows? Is there a carbon accrual effect or how is the carbon content relative to the adjacent land use? And ultimately uh, the goal will be that we have better understanding of the carbon dynamics and um, but also that we can promote uh, you know a scorecard and best management practices for carbon but also for the other ecosystem services uh, that are delivered through our hedgerows. So then in summary um, sure we have the Irish soil information system um, this is, I think, a very important resource that we have for collaboration, particularly as we partner with other countries um, towards meeting the objectives of the soil mission in, in the area of soil health. Um, our mineral soils are an important uh, carbon stock. Um, we need to identify and those opportunities in terms of harnessing the potential of that subsoil carbon. Uh, we need to also always look at uh, how our soils are in relation to their climate regulation potential. So some soils are better than others. Um, and also 
more and more what will be required is integrated management tools that can account for carbon and also those other services as we move uh, forward uh, into the future. So thank you very much. Uh, my contact is there. People are welcome to email me afterwards also after the Q&A. Um, but I'll pass you back uh, to Carl now and thank you very much. Thank you, Lillian. So again, just a reminder, if you have any questions for Lillian, please type them into the Q&A tab and uh, in, include her name in, in the question. So our next talk, the third talk is uh, Dr. David Wall, who is a senior research officer in Johnstown Castle. His research focuses on soil quality and health with a particular emphasis on nutrient cycling and soil fertility. Um, David, if you start sharing your screen, that would be great. Um, so today he's going to talk about some of the current research on management practices to enhance carbon sequestration in our soils. So over to you, David. Thank you, Carol, and good morning, everybody. So I'm going to follow on from, from Gary and, and Lillian's talk to talk about some of the management practices um, that are important. Uh, while this work is, is ongoing, uh, we do have some information um, in terms of those, those practices, um, which has been put out there in the, the Chagos Mac, um, especially those land management or land use mitigation measures such as uh, forestry, um, water table management, grassland management, which I'll go into in, in some detail, uh, tillage management, etc. So these, these managements allow us uh, or affect carbon sequestration. And if we uh, manage appropriately, we can enhance the amount of, of carbon that's laid down on an annual basis and over time then accrue um, increased carbon sequestration. In terms of some of the, the questions that, that we, we have been asked and that, that, that we're asking is, is where is the carbon stored first and foremost? So um, both Gary and Lillian have talked about you know, uh, the, the IPCC, uh, it's, it's, it's looking at speci especially organic soils down to 30 centimetres. However, um, uh, in Irish soils in particular, because of clay alluviation, because of movement of, of, of the finer particles down to lower depths, um, we do have considerable storage at depth. Um, and uh, therefore, we need to be sampling uh, much deeper than we would for agronomic sampling, uh, which is about 10 centimetres of standard in Ireland. Um, we're sampling currently down below a metre um, and looking at the different carbon fractions um, that are uh, stored in the soil and also how stable are those fractions um, and hence is that carbon truly sequestered over time. Very generally, if we think about how we categorize soils based on carbon levels, we know very general that, that our, our mineral soils have uh, lower carbon than our pizza or organic soils. However, where those mineral soils uh, begin to build up a layer of organic matter at the surface, they can become more humose. And in general, the categories there go from um, less than 10 in those mineral soils, well-drained mineral soils, uh, between 10 and 20 in those humus soils, and then for our peat soils, they're typically greater than 20%, right up to 50% in very fibrous peat. So this gives us some uh, indication on the soil groups that we need to, to, to look at, um, the, the management that we need to look at within these soil groups, because they will be different. Obviously, a wetter soil with a more organic layer will need to be managed a little bit differently than a, a very dry mineral soil. In terms of the potential uh, for carbon sequestration in the subsoil, we have looked at that um, in, in the, the square project in particular, where we took uh, sites right across the country. Uh, also taking the soil, Irish soil information system, those network of sites, uh, that work has been done. And what we find in general is in the subsoil there below 30 centimetres, there is considerable carbon stored. You can see there in terms of the different soil uh, types along the bottom, uh, we go from the more organic peaty soils or humic top layers and um, have considerable soil uh, carbon at depth. The well-drained soils, especially 
podzolic soils where you have evidence of clay movement or fine particle movement to depth, um, they also have considerable um, um, uh, carbon stored at depth. And if we think about the, the poorly drained soils, um, there is evidence that carbon can be moved. However, these soils are a lot more prone to soil compaction, which stops rooting. It makes a compacted layer where water can't move down through them. And ultimately, these soils will need to be managed carefully if we expect them to store more carbon down at depth. And obviously, if the carbon gets down there to depth in these poorly drained soils, there's less oxygen, so it becomes more stable and truly sequestered over time uh, under the right conditions. Another question that we've, we've, we've looked at is how can we protect soil carbon levels? So the existing soil carbon that we have in our soils, how can we make sure that the managements that we're using on our, our land uh, help to protect that soil and also enhance um, um, future carbon sequestration? So here's a long-term study um, looked at in Knockbeg and Oak Park, um, uh, County Carlow, where we looked at soil organic carbon over a, a long time series. And as Gary has stated, um, carbon sequestration and carbon laydown in soil organic matter happens over long time periods. So we need to measure it over long time periods if we want to assess change in a realistic um, manner. You can see here, um, we started off with a grassland, a permanent grassland site. And in the, the, the 1990s, it was converted to cropland. And you can see there the fall off in terms of tons of organic carbon over time under conventional plowing uh, tillage and um, cereal production. However, we also looked at some managements. So uh, reduced tillage was one of those managements and then uh, also straw incorporation. So chopping the straw and uh, um, tilling it or leaving it on the soil surface for it to, to, to the carbon in that straw to move back into the soil. And you can see there, over time, those treatments are beginning to in, enhance uh, soil carbon levels and potentially soil carbon sequestration over time. Other long-term research experiments at Johnstown Castle Research Farm, we have a number of long-term uh, experiments. Uh, we possibly have the longest experiment, grassland experiment uh, in the country, and that's the Cowlands experiment. It was initiated in, in 1968, uh, so over, over 50 years uh, of, of data currently. And uh, this uh, experiment had different rates of phosphorus fertilizer application in a, in a grazing uh, system. And you can see there in the picture that's inset, um, the, the P0 versus P30 uh, back a few years back. And you can see there in terms of spring growth, the P0 is looking, um, the, the grass production is, is restricted because of lack of phosphorus fertilizer. So this brings us on to the question as how does soil fertility and grassland management affect soil carbon levels? So, the, the daily practice that farmers are, 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 are employing to grow grass, how are they impacting in terms of carbon levels as well as uh, grass production levels? Here we're looking at labile soil carbon. So it's the soil carbon that's available to the microbes uh, that are in the soil. Um, and we looked at it across the three different um, uh, phosphorus application rates. And you can see there, the long-term grazed uh, plot, there's an increase in soil carbon with increasing fertilizer under grazing systems. However, when we look at a long-term cutting system, you can see there, regardless of the amount of phosphorus that's going in, uh, there's more carbon being uh, removed at higher rates and hence the, the level of labile soil carbon is very static under these conditions. So again, the uh, fertilization strategy shows potential. Uh, better soil fertility will increase grass growth, will enhance the amount of carbon that's potentially sequestered. However, in terms of how we manage uh, the, the grass itself, uh, does have an impact. Two minutes, David. 
Um, in terms of carbon sequestration potential, then, as I said, it takes a long, long time to actually see the changes in terms of the soil organic matter pool and that carbon that's stored in the soil organic matter. So we can employ uh, techniques, so label tracers, as um, uh, Gary has explained, um, labeled carbon dioxide where we put it into the chamber or, or the atmosphere over the plants. We look then where that labeled carbon dioxide uh, ends up uh, through the roots or in the soil uh, or down to depth. And this is the setup that we have at uh, the controlled environment chamber facility at Chagas Johnstown Castle. You can see here the technician John Cardiff is um, um, releasing the, the label into the chamber uh, above the plants and uh, over time then we can uh, test where or, or test the fate of that in the different plant parts, the roots versus the shoots, but also then the soil. And then we can chase that over time in terms of uh, seeing how stable that carbon is. Finally then, um, to follow on from that experiment, we also have a, a long-term experiment um, that, uh, that um, has been initiated to investigate the effects of grassland reseeding method. So here we looked at three different reseeding methods. So no-till or stitching versus conventional plowing to 20 centimeters. Um, compared with very deep ploughing, where you're going down to the, to the uh, top of the subsoil down to 40 centimetres. And you might ask me, why would you deep plough? You're going to turn down your soil fertility, etc. However, if we turn down the carbon layer that's at the top to a deeper level, it has less oxygen, there's less microbial de decomposition. So there's potential there to store more carbon. We also looked at ryegrass monoculture versus some deep rooting multi-species swards. Again, the deep roots on these swards will help to pump carbon deeper into the soil, where it's potentially out of that oxygen layer, undergoing less decomposition and may have in enhanced uh, carbon sequestration or carbon storage. So finally, outputs from this research, estimates we want to develop estimates for, uh, for potential of Irish soils to sequester carbon, to quantify the impact of management strategies on sequestration in mineral soils, and also to design strategies to re reduce loss in managed organic peat soils. We want to model these impacts to understand uh, their effect on total greenhouse gas emissions, so uh, emissions out versus carbon in. Uh, so on net emissions, and then to provide verified results to support carbon accounting in the future for agricultural soils in Ireland. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you, David. Um, Donald, can you uh, start uploading your presentation? So the next presentation is Donald O'Brien, who's a research officer in Chagas Johnstown Castle. His research focuses on modeling of greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture and life cycle analysis. And today he's going to talk to us about the role of carbon sequestration and carbon neutrality of Irish beef and dairy production. So over to you, Donald. All right, th thanks, Carl. Uh, so good morning, everybody. Um, so carbon neutrality is a, a kind of a new or a concept that has been going around for a few years now. Um, and it was first introduced into Ireland in one of the reports uh, Chagas produced on greenhouse gas emissions. So it's a it's at the it's a cornerstone of the Eurozone's uh, new growth strategy. Um, and, it, and it features in Ireland's uh, climate action plan. Uh, it is a concept that aims to balance or neutralize greenhouse gas emissions with carbon sequestration in the soil, as we heard in this, from the speakers early on, earlier, earlier on this morning and in uh, woody vegetation as well. 
So the European Commission uh, plans to become carbon neutral or for Europe to become carbon neutral by 2050 uh, to curb the impact of climate change. And so on this picture here, it kind of in illustrates what a climate neutral economy might look like uh, with less emissions and whatnot, less air pollution, um, cleaner energy and better, uh, better quality environment. So in terms of agriculture, uh, Europe's new green policy um, expects to uh, reward initiatives that lower uh, or reduce the greenhouse gas emissions of agri products. So a few years ago or a while back, the European Commission um, a, a Joint Research Centre conducted a study of greenhouse gas emissions uh, across the different member states and was one of the first studies to use a harmonized methodology, methodology to quantify emissions. Uh, the study ranked the greenhouse gas efficiency of Irish producers uh, very well. Uh, our beef producers ranked in the top five uh, and dairy producers uh, and pig producers were, were the best in terms of their greenhouse gas efficiency. So Ireland, um, so Irish uh, producers, we can say, are, are well positioned in terms of their current levels of greenhouse gas efficiency. Uh, when we look at the European average in this table and look at our colleagues, our, our neighbours uh, in the UK. I suppose then we have the obvious challenges. So there's um, the increasing or the continued uh, requirement to feed the, or nourish the growing middle class population uh, with better quality food products and more sustainable products. Uh, so the global demand for milk and meat products is expected to grow by about one to 2% per annum, um, according to the most recent OECD and FAO project projections. So this chart here from the Central Statistics Office shows the change in uh, Irish milk production and uh, beef production since 1990. And I suppose you can see that it's been relatively, or has been up and down for beef production over that period. And it's uh, started to increase again in the last few years. Whereas for uh, milk production, there has been a strong increase since, since 2015. So the majority of agricultural emissions uh, come from the bovine sector. Um, so up to 90% of our emissions or 85% of our emissions come from, are related to the, to the national, national herd. So if we look at the, the inventory of, uh, of Irish greenhouse gas emissions for agriculture um, from the Environmental Protection Agency, we can see since, the, since they began inventorying these emissions um, that the uh, agriculture sector's emissions were on a, a, a on a downward trajectory or decreasing up until about 2012 or 2013 and since then have started to steadily increase again so this is i suppose largely as a result of uh, strong growth in exports and with the climate action plan targets and with the targets for uh, meeting food security, it will be challenging uh, to meet both of these simultaneously. So the, what are the main greenhouse gas emit emitted by farms? So we have the short-lived, our short-lived hydrocarbon methane um, from from the di digestion of feed by ruminants or cattle and by manure. Um, we have the longer lived uh, nitrous oxide greenhouse gas emission from manure spreading again uh, and animals and from fertilizer uh, through the denitrification de and nitrification processes. And then we also have lime uh, as a source of carbon dioxide through hydrolysis.
So the warming effect or the climate impact effect of these greenhouse gases is, is expressed in terms of carbon dioxide. So hence, uh, greenhouse gas emissions are often collectively known as carbon emissions. Um, so the greenhouse gas potency of uh, methane is uh, 25 times greater than CO2 and 298 times greater for nitrous oxide. Um, some of the newer signs suggest maybe that the, the, the warming effect of methane may be not as high as it breaks down in the atmosphere. So some interesting work from Oxford has shown that uh, it might have a less damaging effect or warming effect on the climate. So I guess we have these greenhouse gas emissions and we need to work out where they all come from and how much they contribute. So a life cycle assessment is uh, and among the best methodologies for computing the greenhouse gas emissions um, using mathematical modeling approaches and use as well to work out uh, typical rates of carbon sequestration in soils or farms. As it's impractical to measure uh, greenhouse gas emissions on every single farm, so they're calculated with this technique. Um, the principles uh, and steps of life cycle assessment are, are, are described or defined by the international standards organizations and more prescriptive guidelines have been developed by other institutions like the British Standards Institute. And it's the methodology that, uh, or approach that's commonly used um, by carbon labels, like so the carbon footprint uh, label by the Carbon Trust EcoCert in France and Europe and the TUV in Germany, um, which is commonly used for other standards as well. So researchers here in Johnstown and I suppose a lot of work in Chagas Moor Park and Grange as well, they have developed comprehensive life cycle assessment models to work out or compute the emissions from beef and dairy production systems um, so they attempt to quantify emissions from on and, and pre-farm sources. And the typical outputs for a beef farm in terms of greenhouse gas emissions show um, that around 60% of the greenhouse gas emission for a beef farm comes from the belching of methane by ruminants. Um, the next largest sources are, are usually nitrous oxide and carbon dioxide from fertilizer application in lime. Um, then more emissions from methane, uh, more methane and nitrous oxide from manures around 10 to 12% and contributions then from the production of uh, or the CO2 embodied in purchased feeds. And unlike most sectors in um, the CO2 loss or greenhouse gas emission loss from fuel and power is generally a minor contributor. And finally, when we look at the potential for carbon sequestration on a beef farm, it can offset around 37% of the emission from a, an average uh, suckler beef farm in Ireland. But it can also be a, a contributor or, or it can uh, release carbon as well, um, depending on the weather, soil type conditions that have been outlined earlier on. So if you look at the the, the greenhouse gas budget of a typical suckler beef farm in Ireland with the LCA models Chagas has developed and using data supplied by the National Farm Survey. We can see that in terms of metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalents per hectare, the greenhouse gas emission is around 4.2 tons per hectare and carbon sequestration in soils um, can net that or reduce that offset it by about 1.9 tons to give a net figure of 2.3. But when we look at, I suppose, the figures here in bracket, it shows that uh, the, the variation or uncertainty around carbon sequestration on farms is still quite high as, as we're, we, we need to gather more information to get better quality estimates on what is the actual likely rate of sequestration versus the modeled rate of sequestration. Then finally, just to look at some of the impacts that management can have, 
So in terms of optimizing soil health and fertility through balancing uh, carbon inputs and nitrogen inputs by better management of nutrients. So taking soil samples, testing uh, and looking at the nutrient status and uh, making decisions around how to improve it. Um, similarly for uh, pH through liming soils and also then through minimizing damage to soils. So avoiding uh, regular poaching or uh, our heavy machinery usage is ways of increasing uh, the organic matter or organic carbon content of the soil, which is a way of then offsetting or further reducing emissions from a beef farm. And what could you then, make, speed up and move to your conclusions, please? Okay. So finally then, uh, just to bring in the other areas where carbon could be um, sequestered, so through growing uh, bioenergy crops on a farm, uh, like a beef farm at a low stocking rate and improving the productivity overall would be a way of uh, further bringing down the carbon uh, emissions close to zero or carbon neutrality. So just to summarize, it's important to say that our current beef our, our cattle systems and dairy systems are net greenhouse gas emitters. As I said, there's a, a job of work to be done on getting a better handle on the rates of carbon sequestration in our soils. But true, I suppose, uh, to end on a positive note, if we can improve our soil and grassland management, it has capacity to bring our, our cattle systems uh, and livestock systems towards carbon neutrality to uh, to valorize the, the products that we are producing uh, from, from the agricultural uh, sector. So, thanks. Okay, th th thank you, Donald, and sorry for putting you under a bit of pressure, but we're a few minutes uh, late. So I'm gonna, gonna allow the webinar to run on maybe five minutes. So run to an hour and five minutes so that we can get through some of the questions. And um, there's been quite an active, uh, questions and answers, and some of which uh, have typed answers as well. So I suppose one for maybe Gary, um, there's a couple of questions around, um, you know, higher soil organic carbon could increase nitrogen cycle and nitrous oxide emissions. Um, you know, if you have comments around that, and also, you know, um, in terms of cut versus graze systems, you know, if you consider the animal emissions, fertilizer emissions, etc., you know, how does that affect the, the overall net carbon balance of the soil? Yeah, Carl. So, yeah, there was a, there was a couple of questions I, I, uh, that I wanted to answer and I, I, I didn't answer. So, so what I would say there is that, um, is that in, in general terms, uh, grazed grasslands are more carbon beneficial than cut grasslands because you're re removing from cut systems all the biomass. Okay, uh, grasslands are more beneficial in the carbon terms than croplands because they're more undisturbed. Okay, and um, there was another question there in terms of peatland soils and how to deal with them. So the the issue with peatland soils is to get the water table as high as possible. So anything that reduces that water table is not going to be beneficial. That includes includes conifer plantations, which I saw Catherine Farrell had a question on that one. Um, okay, Gary. All right, thank, yeah. thank Gary. Um, thank you. In terms right. of the, the impact on the nitrogen cycle, how yeah. important do you think that might be? Yeah, it's very, very important. So, so for example, we can see there's a huge interaction between the carbon and the nitrogen cycle on peatland soils. The more you pour N into the system, the higher the CO2 emissions and the same on mineral soils. So, so cut down your N and you'll cut down your C emissions. Okay, um, Lillian, a, a brief a brief answer to this. Um, there's a question around tree and shrub diversity in hedgerow, and are, is that expected to affect carbon sequestration? So maybe what factors do you think, management factors do you think might affect carbon sequestration of hedgerows? Well, I suppose um, 
in the short answer is yes, you would from in terms of the specific question, um, because of course different species have different growth rates. So in short, that would affect how biomass accumulates. Um, but one of the things we will be looking at is um, across a range of um, ages and management regimes, um, a biodiversity assessment that we can then relate to our carbon measurements to actually be able to quantify that. Um, but of course, things like increasing the width of your hedgerows, allowing trees to grow, uh, mature trees to grow to mature heights, etc. Those are the sorts of things that you would expect to be able to increase your carbon sequestration. And obviously they would have uh, additional benefits in terms of biodiversity as well. Yeah, of course. Yeah. David, a question for you around, you know, which is increasing carbon in soil is that more important in terms of uh, the fertilizer effect of it or for carbon sequestration um, well it's it's somewhat of a compromise so basically what we want to do is we want to produce enough biomass or enough crops to make it economically viable however um, we need to be careful in terms of putting on the right amount in the right place at the right time to make sure that we grow more grass pump more carbon, but we don't enrich the soil with nitrogen to increase decomposition or mineralization of that carbon. So it, it is a compromise. Okay. Uh, Donald's question here for you in relation to how much carbon in gr is grassland sequestering in tons of CO2 per hectare? Also is the long-term or grassland long-term towards seven years or more? Any comments on that, or maybe that's something you need to reflect on? Yeah, I, I just maybe a quick comment back on that is um, when we looked at, I suppose, all of the information that has been gathered in Chagas uh, through the soil um, systems and databases that we have and through the Soils of Ireland publication that I think around 0.5 of a ton of carbon per hectare, which is around two uh, tons of carbon dioxide equivalent per hectare was kind of the typical rates of sequestration in permanent grasslands. But uh, as I guess I said, or alluded to in, in the short talk I had, that there is a large, of, I suppose, um, variability around that figure. So it's very much dependent on all of the factors that were uh, discussed through the talk, soil type, weather conditions, management, etc. And obviously, Donal, a number of speakers have spoken about um, trying to better refine that for different soil types in Ireland through further research. And I suppose, Donal, you yourself also raised the issue of the impact of climate change on that sequestration, changing it from, you know, potentially a sink to a source, depending on the particular wetting and drying cycle that, that might happen as a result of climate change. Um, there's another quick question here. It's in relation to, I suppose, historical land use. But, you know, tillage was obviously, a, you know, had a larger area in the 1800s and um, and this has obviously decreased during the 1900s in terms of, uh, you know, grassland, etc. You know, the, the questioner says, I'd, I'd be interested to see what your, your reconstructive emissions show. So maybe just more of a comment around how are those historical emissions handled in the inventory? Um, yeah, 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 actually, it's one thing we're trying to do, Carl, at the moment is reconstruct. Uh, back to 1845, uh, the, the, the emissions. And what we can see is that we can see, certainly in the silt and clay associated carbon, the previous land use is back, back to 100, 200 years ago. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Okay. So it's something we're looking at. Okay, and, look, and, and a final question um, relates to crop. So... Is the choice for cropland typical on the aforementioned soil type due to the latter's properties or are the properties, i.e. poor structure and low soil organic carbon a result of cropland management practices? And um, is this the same for grassland? So I suppose, you know, Gary, you highlighted that. It's a bit of both. It's a bit of both. So, so the, the sandier soils are more trafficable and they're quicker draining and they're less prone to aggregate formation. Um, so, so you're right, it, 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 there will be less aggregate formation. There'll be a, a smaller sink if you look at that sink. Um, but at the same time, the land management will have, will have an impact.
Okay, look, I think we will uh, stop the, the questions there. And, you know, the, some of the questions have been answered during the session in terms of typed responses, but we will be putting up all the questions and answers uh, after, after the webinar. So look, I'd just like to thank the four speakers for giving us a really great overview of the role of carbon sequestration in Irish soils. Um, just remind everybody to go to the webinar series webpage for more information and to re or rewatch the webinars. Um, the next uh, Research Insights webinar will focus on the new Chagas Gamonia MAC report, which is due to be published today on the Chagas website. And this will give you an overview of the management practices that can be carried out on Irish farms to reduce ammonia emissions. There will also be a feedback survey when the webinar is over. And if you could spend a minute just completing that, would be very helpful. So we look forward to uh, your participation at the next webinar on the 7th of October at 9.30 in the morning. Thank you very much.